Good Sunday morning once again. This is the first Sunday in May. And May is normally known as the Mother's Month, uh, the Love Month, but every Sunday morning is a great morning to be in the house of worship. And whether it's May, June, July, or January, it's always good to be in the house of the Lord, regardless of what month or what day it is. Maybe you can come and worship on Monday or Tuesday and Bible study or Wednesday when you, some churches have Bible study. But it's, my point is, it's just good to be in the house of worship. And yes, this is the first Sunday and we will be serving communion this morning. So with that being said, we will get started. As my helper is not here present this morning, I know one is on vacation, or went on vacation, and he let his service to the Lord but go on vacation as well. Nevertheless, we shall proceed on. This little light of mine, and I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, and I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Jesus gave it to me, and I'm going to let it shine. Jesus gave it to me, and I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. All in my home, and I'm going to let it shine. All in my home, and I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Everywhere I go, I'm going to let it shine. Everywhere I go, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine. Let it shine, this little light of mine, and I'm going to let it shine. Yes, this little light of mine, and I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Let us note for our scripture reading, this is the part where he usually reads. And like I said, he's off on vacationing. Let's uh, pray for his safety and safe return. We'll be reading from the book of Romans, the eighth chapter, and for our verses two through four. But since I'm reading it, I'll read the verse one through four. And it reads as follows. There is, therefore, now no condemnation in them, in, to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has been made, has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak, through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. Verse four reads, that the righteousness of the law might be, might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. May the Lord end it. Blessing to the reading and the hearing of his, of his holy word. Shall we pray? Most kind, gracious Heavenly Father, it's once again that we come before your throne of grace. Father, we come to say thank you for your love, your grace, and your mercy. Then, Father, we thank you for opening doors that we might be able to assemble ourselves out to the house of worship one more time. Kind Father, we just thank you for opening the doors when, uh, through technology 
when you close the physical doors to church building, then Father, we just thank you for all everything that you have done and will do in our lives. Then Father, we ask you to continue to bless each and every one of us collect, uh, individually and collectively as you rain down your blessings upon this church and every church that is open in your name. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Good morning. Good morning. And how are you this fine day? I'm blessed and I'm well. That's good. That's good. As they say, as long as we're on top of the dirt and in table order, we're doing all right. We didn't bat in a hundred. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. All righty. So we're beginning a a new unit in our spring quarter of this uh, Sunday school lesson. And for the past few weeks, a month, we have looked at uh, the theme from different perspectives, God frees and redeem. And we looked at uh, unit one was the liberating Passover, liberating the gospels. And the last unit we will study is the liberating letters that Paul is writing to the, the Roman and the believers and Galatian believers as telling them about sin and, and uh, what sin does for us. We, we are slave to sin and we are destined for eternal separation from the Father if we don't change our ways in so many ways, it's what he's saying. And once we believe in Jesus Christ and accept him as our savior, then we are free from sin. And as uh, if all of us said in my classes, that we, the true liberation is through Jesus Christ. Yeah, we might have freedom from different things, but true freedom is through Jesus Christ. And when we can keep our mind free from the many various um, binding activities that will cloud our minds, sometimes it get us, calls us to have uh, some anxiety attacks and different things. But when we can keep our minds focused on the right thing, the right way or on the right person, who have taken care of all of our situations. And we are here, left here in the world for a reason. And that is the one is to keep shining the light of Christ and his righteousness in this world. And I'll say this, and I'm going to get this. Well, I'm in the lesson, but I'm going to get to the, the scripture part of it. Is that we are to continue to preach and teach and live a godly life. Because there's so many people in the world that don't know Christ. And if they don't see it in us who say we are believers, then how would they ever know? Because if they have a Bible, do they read it? That's a good, <laughs> that's a good question. And if they read it, do they understand what they're reading? So that is incumbent upon us as believers is to shine that light, be that light for them. And this is what Paul is telling in this lesson He's talking to the Roman believers. And when he starts with this, and uh, verse one, it says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may be abound? And then he was talking to them about, you know, you say you are a believer, but you know, I don't see it in your lifestyle. Here you are, uh, say you have accepted Christ but yet you are continuing to live in sin and do the things that you did before you became a Christian. And this is the whole nuts and bolts of this lesson is Paul is trying to get old it, to the Roman believers that know if you are in Christ, you died with Christ and all those fleshly desires and ways that you used to live, you don't do that anymore. Because if he did, then uh, what was the point of him dying? To bring us salvation and freedom from sin. 
And this is what he was he was saying here. And that's it. That was an implied question. That to that, listen, we are saved by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And when we look at the true definition of grace and what it means, it means God, the Father's righteousness, at who at Christ's expense, because Christ was the only one that was found worthy to pay our sin debt. We made it, but oh, heaven forbid, we could not do. We could not pay our own debt off. And I know I talked about being sinfully bankrupt <laughs> last week, <laughs> last week, because we couldn't pay it. So that's why we were sinfully bankrupt. We couldn't pay. And I use the analogy when we get overextended in debt and we cannot get out, we have to go for our bankrupt <laughs> and try to make a new start. But Jesus Christ was the only one found worthy to pay our sin debt. So now we as believers, our heavenly bank account is marked paid in full. And that should be enough to shout about. But here I had somebody that did for me what I couldn't do for myself. Now I don't have to be looking over my shoulder about what's coming after me next. But I'll say this one thing, and then I'm going to get to the question two, verse, uh, verse two. When we are out there in that corrupt world, we're constantly looking over our shoulder of who's coming behind us to do us some harm because we are in the mix of that stuff. And, you know, sin and corruption breeds sin and corruption. And, and let me use this drug analogy. When they if I heard about these drug people that's in the drug, and the pushes is not the right word, but that's the word that they use, drug dealers. When they are dealing, they, they always kind of look over their shoulder of who's coming to take their territory, who's coming to steal their, their goods and make off with the money. And then if it, it, it just, it's just it's corrupt all the way around. So he, we who and we are, have been redeemed from that corrupt sinfulness life, we cannot say we are Christian and trying to live a Christian life and still doing all those kinds of things. And the drugs might have been a bad analogy, but it's sinful. Let's look at, well, before I get there, I stand ready to say, talk about this homosexuality because it is a sin. And if you go to Romans, what is it? Uh, not 12, 19. Uh, in Romans, in this chapter, because Paul is gonna address it. And I don't know in my Sunday school lesson, not today, we're going to get there to where he speaks about sex, homosexuality. It is a sin. And so you, you, when we say that we are in Christ and, and then society is having us believe that it's okay. And I, I'm going to get to this one. Society is wrong and we should not be sitting up there telling, letting society tell me it's okay to be a homosexual because you were born that way. No, you just I've got so far out there in sin that you just can't get around it or you need Christ to help you get out of that mindset. That's the point I'm, I'm trying to make. Help us get out of that mindset. And then uh, he was saying, Paul, he in here in this little Roman book that he said, now listen, God didn't make you be lusting after others, the same flesh. Okay, and I'm, as I'm talking, I'm trying to get over to that uh, Paul Romans. Now, this is Corinthians, but I'm not going to dwell on it today because we are both likely going to cover it. But the point I'm trying to make here is this, is that sin is sin and it is wrong, and you can't make take sin and make it right. No more than you can take the truth and right and make it wrong. But that's what society is trying to do. So Paul's question is so that, listen, when he asked him in verse one, he said, now listen, if you're going to continue to sin, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may be abound? And verse two, he said, God forbid, I think not. That's what he's saying. How shall we 
that dead that are dead to sin and living any longer therein. So this was a thought-provoking question that Paul is asking, asking the Roman believer. Listen, you say that you are a believer, but yet you're still living that sinful life. Okay, how can that be? In other words, he is saying that, listen, that you say you are, but yet your lifestyle doesn't say that. You know, the world won't judge us by how we, we live because that's what they see in us. Not so much of what we say, but when the two go together, what we say and how we live, when those two parallel, then that's a powerful impact. But when the world can see Christ in us, then that's, they will know who we are. That's all Paul is saying to them. Listen, uh, we today and back then, is visit C. let me say, say this, what Paul is addressing needs to be addressed today by the morally corrupt, sinful condition that we see. And, and I, I don't want to say it this way, but I don't quite know how to say it other than when we say we are in, in Christ, and yet still live in morally corrupt life, then our faith, what is, what is challenging us? That's not what we are supposed to do. And, okay, now, what is the quote? Uh, the world is challenging our faith right now, today, just as it was back in Paul's day when he was inspired him to write these letters to the Galatian believers and the Roman believers and trying to get them, listen, you are in Christ and you should not be living a, a, a sinful life anymore. You should get a move away from that. We have the Holy Spirit to help us live that saved life or that righteous life instead of living a sinful life. Okay, and I don't have the scripture in my mind right this moment, but I was going to say, when we find that some people uh, say they're in Christ, but rather than get married, they'd rather live together. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, they'd rather live together. Okay, so where is your faith? What did Christ, what did God say about marriage? The two come become to come are to become one. He didn't say about living together, and I did. He said the two will become one. I have to find that scripture, hopefully by next Sunday, but is that it's just not scripturally found base. Because if you love the person enough to live with them, then what's the difference? Uh, why is it you love them enough and have enough faith in them to marry? To be because marriage is a holy institution established by God. He did not establish it with Ethel and Sarah, no more than he did with Adam and Steve. He took Adam and Eve and put them together and told them to be fruitful and multiply. That means they are supposed to come together and, and produce some children. Not the other way around, okay? Now, so those are some of the things that challenge in our faith today as believers. So what are we supposed to do? Or what can we do? Well, number one, we have to stand for what we know is right. We cannot compromise with the world because the world sees it as politically correct or politically okay. But what's, and my thing is, what does the scripture say? Then we can't say that uh, I'm a believer and I believe the Bible when we're being selective by what we believe. Because remember this, the world and God is on a collision course. And what do I mean by that? They're 
at odds with each other. The world is never going to agree with God. And neither is God going to agree with the world. He's not going to accept what they say is correct and still be God. He just doesn't do that. He can't do that. Because if he says, I establish marriage between a man and a woman, that is what's going to be acceptable. And if we as believers want to say, well, it's okay for two men or two women to marry, then where, where are we? We are compromising with the world. And, and, and please don't take this out of any other way than what I'm trying to get a point over. As we as the church must stand on the truth of what God says. Do we have to do we do we condemn them or do we hate them? No, we don't. You still love the person because they are God's created human being, just as we are. They're just having an error in that. Thank you. <laughs> they just, they're well put. Mm -hmm. They're just having well, yeah, it is true. So what we do, we talk to them and witness them and give them the scriptures and let God, the Holy Spirit, do the rest. No, you don't condemn them. And I had to tell them, I said, no, I'm not going to condemn you because you are not the first one that did A, B, and C, and you won't be the last. But my job is, is to tell you what's right. I'm going to continue to love you, but I'm not going to love your lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Neither can I condone. That's what we as Christians are supposed to do. This is what Paul is talking to the Roman believers. Because remember who we are. We are those lit candles that Christ talked about that live in this sin darkened world. And we have to shine the light of his righteousness in the world for it to see. But we can't do it if we're compromising with the world and accepting their immoralities as morals. We can't do that. So we have to say, okay, here's what the scripture says. And I'm going to leave it at that. <laughs> okay. So now, and I had a other, a other point that I said, that when we are saved, and I know I preached this some, salvation is an inside job. And it's an inside job because it starts in the heart. We have determined in our hearts by listening to, uh, to the conviction work of the Holy Spirit and accepting Jesus, I made up my mind that I am going to accept him and his salvation, knowing that I need a Savior. Therefore, I am telling me, myself and God and the world that I am no longer going to be bound by sin. So when we make that conviction that we are dead to sin, we have made a definitive decision to walk in the newness of, of Christ. Therefore, we must make every effort to do, live according to God's standards, leaving the world behind, okay? And now I don't have it in my heart, my mind right now where Paul says, well, the things that I should do, I don't do because there's a war going on between the spirit and the flesh. And he's telling us this. And I said, listen. And Paul said that he we cannot, he makes it very clear. We as believers cannot be a slave to sin and righteousness at the same time. It's just like two peas and a shell. One's right, one's wrong. Okay. Oh, uh, let's put it this way. One is, is going bad and the other is still good. If you leave the bad one in there long enough, it's going to corrupt the good, <laughs> good one. Have you ever had apples in your fruit tray and one is beginning to rot? And if you don't take that rotten one out, guess what? If that rot will spread to the rest of it. Same principle. So, <laughs> so that's why he's making it. When we make that definitive decision, that decision, I'm going to live for Christ, then we are saying, I'm through with this world out here. It has nothing to offer me but destruction. 
That's what he, and that's the message he was trying to get over to the, uh, the believer in Rome. And that's the same message that is applicable today, that we are trying to get over to the lost world that, listen, you need to come out of the world because you are doomed for destruction. You are already living in a world filled with hate and sin. When you leave this world as life as we know it, what do you expect? Where do you expect to go? And I've heard young, you know, some of these young folks say, well, it don't make a difference. It should. <laughs> it should make a difference where my soul is going to spend eternity. Here I'm being abused here in this world. I'm being discriminated against. I'm being talked about in a negative way. I'm being oppressed in every way possible. But yet when I, my life is over, I have no place to go but to live in further hell for an eternity. That's just not what I, I want for myself. Okay. So Paul keeps on talking to the believers. And in verse 3, he says, Know ye not that uh, many of us were baptized in Jesus Christ, was were baptized into his death. What Paul is saying to us, and we say it so many times, all who believe died with Christ to sin on Friday. But on Sunday morning, when Christ rose, we rose with him because we arose to a new being, a new creature in Christ, and that all that old sinful corruption passed away. It is no longer exist that controls our minds and our hearts and our thoughts is what I'm trying to get to. Okay, because when it says there's that old nature has been put to death. The things when I used to say, uh, we used to think that we used to do that uh, was not of God or not. Of, I know us parents used to tell us, well, you shouldn't be drinking and dancing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so many other things, you know, they were talking to us about how to have more standards as young men and women, because we were going to grow up one day and be the leaders of our generation. And the ones that was coming behind us is looking to us on how we live our lives and for direction. And if we are living corruption and sinful, what can we tell them? So, uh, as just as Paul was stressing that point, we cannot say that we are in Christ and constantly living a sinful life. He's saying you cannot be oscillating back and forth. And it really speaks to the point that what Jesus told his followers, the one when he was walking here, man cannot serve two masters. You're either going to hate one and love the other, or you're going to vice versa. So this is the same thing Paul is saying. If when we accept Christ and made that determination that we are going to come members of Christ's church, or members of God, holy nation, a priest, then we must let that old life go. Okay. Well, let me see if I can use this one. An alcohol addiction, a drug addiction. Okay. Though we know those is bad for the body. Okay. But when we make up in our minds, and I know I used this at, at once before, and okay, you, you witnessed that when you said he made up in his mind that he was going to let cigarettes alone. And the young man made up in his mind he wasn't going to drink anymore. He just, he said, I'm done with it. And asked the Lord to take the taste of liquor out of his mouth. And it was over with. So what am I saying? We have to have that mindset. Because say, remember this, Satan is still afterwards and he will use those things to keep us 
from walking in the newness of Christ. He sure will. Yeah. He will use family members to hurt our feelings sometimes to the point that we said, I just need to give up. But we step back and get down on our knees and say, Lord, help. And recognize how Satan will come at us sometime from the inside. He doesn't always attack us from the outside. And this was pointed out in one of my Bible study lessons in the book of Acts, where how Satan, he couldn't, he was unsuccessful at that time of attacking the church from the outside. So he used the church members from the inside to attack the church. Point being, Satan is a master of schema and he will use anybody, any scheme at any time. But what we must do is to stay prayed up and asking God for his strength and his powers and his discernment to know Satan is coming after us and how we have to deflect him. And he gave us those in Ephesians 6, 11 through 17. And ask us to, um, well, 18, because you got to keep praying, to keep on walking in his way. This is what Paul says to him. Now listen. And listen to the other thing that Paul said in verses three through five. When Paul continues to make it his case on believers being dead to sin and was raised with Christ on Sunday morning. And it reads as this, verse four through five. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism and his death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in the newness of life. Instead of making this point. Verse 5. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. That says it all. He said, listen, just like we died with him, we rose with him. Christ knew no sin, but he took on sin. So, and we're going to be like him. We have to walk in his righteousness every single day. Now, uh, how do we get to do that? Let me just open up this little book here and go to uh, Romans 12. And I'm going to go to verse 2. When he tells us we have to have a renewed mind every day. We can't get bogged down in all of this foolishness uh, that goes on around us and who's all is everything. Verse 12, verse 2 of, of uh, Romans 12 reads, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? So what Paul is saying to us is this, that we must, we must stay in Christ through our, find us a scripture to read every day and a prayer of pray because God's grace it's so profound in goodness every day. And we know that Satan is very, very, what's the word I'm looking for? Dedicated and, to, and to, uh, committed to his, his job of deterring believers from their walk in Christ. So therefore we must, uh, we are encouraged to keep our focus on God and his righteousness instead of uh, looking back. So let me see if I can give this analogy and help it make sense. Remember in our Old Testament uh, that, um, that when sin had gotten so corrupt, when uh, God told them or delivering Abram, Lot and his wife out of that situation, 
And he told a lot of her, his lot's wife, not to look back. And if she did, what is going to happen? She, she gave in to temptation and looked back. And what happened? She became a pillow of salt. Yeah. So what's the, good morning, what's the analogy yeah. here? Is that when we walk away from sin, good morning, that we must rely on God, the Holy Spirit, to give us that strength to not go back to them old ways. Because Amen. the power of sin and its temptation is great. And that's Amen. why you hear us say, preachers and teachers and lay people, that we are no match for Satan in our own strength. He is a powerful force. And his job is, once again, to deter us from being successful in our walk with Christ. But I want us to remember this. Christ has already overcome this mess that we are living in. And that's why he left his defensive weapons for us to live by. He, listen, he gave us all defensive weapons to defeat Satan. He gave us one offensive weapon. That was his word, to take the fight to Satan. And listen to me very carefully. When Satan sees us, believers, that is God-focused, Christ-centered, and with a fervent prayer life, he might come back, but he already knows he's not going to be defeated. He's going to be defeated. Because he is an already defeated for, and when we can go, as I was just read in, in Romans 12 and 2, that when we can keep our minds on Christ, and we do that by looking to him every day, we was created to be dependent, not independent of Christ, but dependent, meaning that we depend on him for his strength every single day and every moment of the day because there's so much wickedness going on till we need him every day. We best can't get <laughs> without. So if I can kind of move on and Paul is, is, is get the last verses in, that Paul is really making his point about holy living if we are in Christ, we must, and we in his, that we should walk and live for Christ every day because the old man was crucified with Christ. And then verse talking out of verse six, and I'll read it and get through. No, verse six through nine, I'll read those three. No, I'll keep going to verse 11 because I'm going to close with 12. I got five minutes. Knowing <laughs> this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Remember, we either serve in God or we serve in sin. Serving God has a reward. Sin does not. Verse seven, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Meaning what? We died with Christ. Verse says that. Hey, if now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. And that has been the whole thing we've been talking about. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead, died no more. He died one time and we died with him and we rose with him. Death has no more dominion over him. He conquered death, hell, and the grave. So we are winners through Christ. We cannot live a defeated life as a Christian. We live a victorious life through Christ who lives in us. Verse 11 said, for in that he died, he died unto sin once, but he that lived, he liveth unto God. 12, verse 11, likewise, reckon this, that you also yourself be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto Christ, God through Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior. Now, that, <laughs> that's, that's putting it in a nutshell. Okay, hello. So he said this, and I'm almost finished. 
They give me time to put this robe on. I forgot it last week. <laughs> it says, now listen, verse 12 and our last two verses says this. He's giving us helpful advice to combat the battle between sinful flesh, which I mentioned in verse uh, Paul, verse Romans 12 and 2. Because the spirit man is saying go one way, the flesh man is saying going another way. Remember, it said there's a war going on between our flesh and our spirit. Spirit always going to want to go right way. Flesh always going to be lusting after the eye for temptation of what we can see and what because you know what, lust make it and sin makes it puffs itself up so big. It makes us feel like, oh, I can do all of this and I'm all that and two, three bags of chips. And lo and behold, we're not even more. <laughs> okay, so what is my closing point? What is it? Let's not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body that you should obey it and the lust thereof. Once you are a believer in Christ, all of that sinfulness, lustfulness has to go bye-bye, <laughs> okay? Because, I say this again, sin and righteousness cannot live in the same house. One gonna overshadow the other. And sin in our own strength is more powerful than we are, okay? So, let me make the Paul's final argument when he said, Christ fulfilled the law by his atoning works by the grace of God. And we are required to live holy lives because once we are in Christ, we are children of God. And each one of us in our earthly lives, we have a pain and we have some resemblance of our parents. So when we are in Christ, we should have some resemblance of Christ. I'm gonna close with this story. Man had gotten so wicked to God looked at and asked his son, Jesus Christ, are those my people? That that's what I created? And Christ said, yes, father, there you go. Prepare me a body and I'll go down in the gym. What am I saying? We as believers are Christ's children. We are God's children. So we should have some righteousness in us so the world will know. Now those are God's children. <laughs> okay, have you ever heard this phrase? Have you ever heard this phrase when they say, oh, and I'll use my name, but you could use it. Oh, that's Emma's child over there. Oh, that's the Cajun's child over there. So be quiet because the standards, the family values that was instilled in us growing up, when we go out, the world will know that's, those, that's your children. Those are your children. Those are so-and-so's children because we carry those same values and morals with us every day. Same principle, same point that when God says, when we are in Christ, the world needs to look at us and know those are God's children. That's my whole point. And I'll close with this. Is there any questions or comments? No questions or comments? No? Well, let us just close in prayer. Father God, we thank you for the Sunday school lesson that is reminding us that once we accept Jesus Christ as our personal savior, we are no longer children of the world of Satan to be banded about, talked about, or dismayed, but we are children of God who are um, to live in righteousness and holiness letting the world know and see the moral values and standards 
of our heavenly fall. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Okay.